If you're who you are becomes the public declaration of your opinion, everyone who does not think like this is not me. People who are not me are vermin and my enemy. And that is, interestingly, it's not just a way of hating, it's a way of strengthening and bolstering your own identity. And I'm not interested, really, in being on anyone's team. I'm going to think, what do I actually think about this? And see if the detail, in the subject or indeed in my life, will lead to an opinion. It's a problem if you've got a hierarchy of racism. It's positioning Jews as white and therefore not in what I call the sacred circle of minorities. Identity, now very much, is something that you can formulate through the public declaration of your opinions, right? And the problem with that is that, it's, I mean, it's not always a problem because it can be okay in terms of discussion, but the problem I think that is that if you're who you are becomes the public declaration of your opinion, then how do you turn the volume up on that? Because what is social media? It's a way of being heard. You need to turn the volume up. You turn the volume up on it by your ideas reifying, that is becoming much more solid and inflexible, and by sh saying them in opposition. That's how you turn the volume up on that. You say, everyone who does not think like this is not me. Not just they think differently, they are not me. And hum humans, I think there's lots of evidence for this, tribally, the way they tend to create identity, and you can see it in religion, is by saying the people who are not me are vermin. Yeah. and my enemy and that is interestingly it's not just a way of hating it's a way of it's a way of strengthening and bolstering your own identity do you think that was probably an evolutionary trait that helped us in tribes I, I, should we wait for that to go yeah i guess it adds i always wonder um, it adds to the heretics see what's tone, happening is you're being arrested by the police for free speech because <laughs> we're in 1984 you guys. know what that would blow up the internet though because if if i've got you're a famous name and if suddenly the police came in and, and i'm here and i'm going like well if i was being arrested and you're going what's that what have i been invited on yeah. and we sort of kept that on it would be it would be, That'd be absolutely brilliant a but it would be staged a fellow you without well unless it actually happened <laughs> yeah. a fellow youtube uh, yesterday i spoke to alex o'connor uh, he was he was known as cosmic skeptic he's a famous sort of vegan and atheist um he had a a thing with Peter Hitchens recently where they argued and right. Peter got up and walked out and because what, he, what did he get up and argue, walk out about because it seems to me that Peter Hitchens must be walking out of like many things it looked it was bad and it, because Alex was in favor of um uh, uh, what is it uh, uh, legalizing drugs right. and that, that is Peter Hitchens he hates that yeah. and they spoke about it for quite some time and then Peter said I've, I've had enough of this I'm not I'm not having it I, I, I can't I'm not doing this anymore you have me under, here under false presenters you said we'd talk about this for a third of the interview it's been at least half <laughs> and I'm not doing it anymore gets up and then he says you put it out if you want and you can see he's off He's off camera he's going you put it out if you want but I, I, I don't want anything to do with it in fact you shouldn't put it out you shouldn't put it out and I'll tell you why because you've had me under false presenters <laughs> and he's just going back and forth it was so mad it's got nearly 2 million views now of course it has because people love that shit yeah. but interesting I'm going to mention talk about Peter Hitchens for a second Yeah. Uh, as a good example Example of uh, how the inflexibility of opinion, or at least the creation of identity via types of opinion that mean that all that happens is that people fall into teams, is problematic and also can be subverted. But when it's subverted, it doesn't work. Sorry, that sounds really, really abstract. I'll explain with, with the example. <laughs> so Peter Hitchens is very against the legalization of drugs, especially cannabis. Uh, and uh, I don't have a very straightforward opinion on that, but one thing I do think, and I guess this is why you might have me on this program, is a long time ago, I thought, I don't think I can think in teams, i.e., I don't think I can think I am X, left-wing, progressive, whatever else it might be, even Jewish, whatever, that isn't going to formulate my opinion on individual subjects. I'm going to think, what do I actually think about this, and see if the detail in the subject or indeed in my life will lead to an opinion. So as far as cannabis goes and the legalization of it, there is a thing, which is that a close family member of mine had a cannabis psychosis when he was in his 20s uh, that was incredibly destructive to his life at the time. Uh, and I was sort of looking after him for a long time. Uh, and it was very, very difficult. It was very similar and in fact was diagnosed as the first strike symptoms of schizophrenia. And it took him many long time to recover from it and it's always made me think it's probably not as simple as all that the idea that we should just legalize cannabis particularly now that some strains of cannabis are you know skunk and whatever very very psychoactive and can do that and i'm not sure there's that there's a real understanding that can do that or whatever so i 
said something to that effect back in the day when I do something that I did something which I didn't do, don't do anymore, which is to sort of comment on virtually every fucking thing on social media. <laughs> I now think that's not the right way to behave. But I used to do it all the time. And Peter Hitchens kind of got in touch and said, said, oh, it'd be really great. And I think what he thought was if someone like you, who I think he would imagine, because obviously you're always dealing with the assumptions about you, uh, everyone is, uh, particularly on social media, these sort of public assumptions of who they are and what they think. Mm-hmm. Uh, if someone like you were to speak out about, you know, against the legalization of cannabis, and I thought, well, that's not really what I think. Mm. What I think is just it should be in the mix and in the conversation that sometimes cannabis can do this. It can lead to a psychosis that is very dangerous. Uh, and I'm not sure that's in the conversation about the legalization of cannabis. But what he was doing was trying to put me on his team. Yeah. And I'm not interested really in being on anyone's team. And that is a very long way of saying that's why I'm a heretic. <laughs> well, no, I know what you mean. You become, you become their beard. You're like yeah. the beard of, of him. People so are very interested in that with me a lot of the time. I suppose people well, are, you're, you're, like, like I wrote a play called God's Dice, um, which is about religion and physics, uh, and which I think is a good play. But it was, uh, and it was on just before the pandemic at Soho Theatre. Mm. Uh, and it's essentially about how a uh, rather sort of exhausted, middle aged, uh, sort of second rate physicist lecturing at a college uh, suddenly has this student who's a Christian, a young Christian woman who uh, is a genius, and she can d- demonstrate that uh, you can prove that certain miracles, like water into wine, are physic- in terms of physics possible. She can work out a probability equation that shows the pr- probability of water turning into wine. Uh, and it leads to all sorts of consequences. Uh, and it got very, very mixed reviews, uh, and I'm just going to say this, which sounds incredibly uh, self-aggrandizing, but it got, incredibly, it got very mixed reviews from critics who many didn't understand it. Okay. One critic who really didn't understand it was Quentin Letts, who gave it a four star review in the Sunday Times? Hmm. He gave it a four Out star. Of f- f- five. <laughs> five. Not bad. Yeah. yeah. No, no, he gave it a really glowing review uh, in the Sunday Times, which, which is a good thing for me from a commercial point of view, but he completely didn't understand the play because he thought it was a pro Christian play, uh. uh, a, a pro God play, and also kind of a pro Middle England play, right? He thought it was like, and ended up writing a long thing about how he felt like empowered as a person who believes in sort of church bells and I think he said devil kidneys on toast and the whole sort of (laughs) Middle England thing. And in the review was this sense of David Baddiel of all people has written Mm. a play that demonstrates, you know, sweary comedian David Baddiel has written this play which makes me feel, and people like that, they like to feel that they've sort of poached someone who they think is from the other side. But my position is, A, obviously he'd misunderstood the play, but thank you, anyway, Quentin, for the yeah, sure. for the start. But also, I am not really on anyone's side except my own, which sounds selfish. What I mean is my own intellectual side. Yeah. Well, Christopher Hitchens, uh, I'm rereading Hitch 22, so the brother of Peter, uh, called it double accounting. He was always double accounting. He was sort of a Marxist, but then he sort of half almost voted for Thatcher. Yeah. And he was back and forward. And I suppose even double accounting doesn't isn't nuanced enough. Uh, it's not as nuanced as what you're saying, which is because double accounting is two sides, and you're saying, well, no sides. Just yeah. let's see what no, what's I, what. And I think Christopher Hitchens, who was brilliant in many ways, <laughs> but I, I would still say you kind of know where his uh, mm. positions were going to fall on yeah. most subjects. Um, and I would say that I try, without wishing to say that, oh, I'm much more unpredictable than Christopher Hitchens, I'm not saying that. But I, in my own way of being, when someone asks me a question about a difficult subject, I think, what do I think about this? I don't think, mm. here's an ideological map I have pre-prepared, which fits in with my identity, and I can fit that onto that subject. And the, the, the pattern finder in me is trying to work out some, some of where you stand. So, for example, when you repeated the names Andrew Doyle and Peter Bogosian a few sentences later, I thought it was unlikely that you would have been able to do if you didn't weren't already familiar with them. And I'm not really very familiar with Peter Bogosian. But I you just were able to his name. Said, I just remember that you said it. Well, I've seen it. I've seen it on social media. <laughs> I know who Andrew Doyle is, yeah. uh, but I don't really know who Peter Bogosian is. Okay, it was a good word. Well, you, you've seen the name. I'm then, sorry. Okay. So he's probably watching because he like is part. He of this does world, watch sometimes. Part of this world. He does I, watch I apologize. He's a smart academic. Peter Pagosian. Peter was just so you know he was the he was one of the guys who did that uh, with Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay. They did the uh, this sort of fakery where they put forward about twenty uh, articles to scientific publications that were had very sort of uh, woke ideas. So yeah. uh, Mein Kampf is a feminist manifesto. Here's right. why, and I think like ten of them, or like a big percentage, got accepted onto very prestigious publications. And right. so they were showing that there wasn't a, you know wasn't a, enough scrutiny in academia. Right. So yeah, okay. That's who they are. Right. Um, can identity politics then, given what you've just said, can identity politics work, or are we going a little bit wrong? Well, identity politics as an idea um, is, I guess, speaks 
of that that problem. And when I wrote to you, Jews don't count. Um, it's premised on the idea that identity politics has a crack in it as regards Jews, uh, because of identity politics, which may be reductive to what people think it is. But if identity politics is about okay, how can we support and uh, vulnerable identities? Essentially, it's about how can the, how can progressives who would adhere to identity politics. Uh, define the world in terms of vulnerable identities that they need to ally with. That seems to be what identity politics is. How can we identify vulnerability and say these are the ones we should adhere to and, and support and ally with and think of the world in terms of their position? Let's let's look at the world not from if it's a white, you know, progressive, middle class, whatever person looking at the world, like how can I empathize with this other position, right? Which seems like a good idea and probably is a good idea in some respects. But it has a crack in it, which is that the identity Jewish is difficult to locate within that world if what you're thinking about is just a power dynamic. In my documentary, of Jews Don't Count, uh, Jonathan Safran Fur, I can't remember whether this made it into the final cut, but it should have done if it didn't. Jonathan Safran Fur said the problem is a worldview, which sometimes comes from identity politics, where the world is just victimizers and victimized. That's yeah. it. It can be divided into victimizers and victimized, and everything follows from that. We should condemn the victimizers and we should side with the victimized. And the problem is, where are Jews in that equation? And somehow or other, despite thousands of years of persecution and discrimination and exile uh, and obviously genocide, Jews somehow exist a hard to imagine as the victimized. Uh, and so that book was about that. Yeah, and some people, and I'm, I don't know in a way what my if this was my intention because I don't think it was, but some sometimes I get people saying, "Oh, I don't like this book because uh, I think it suggests that Jews uh, want to be in the same box as all the other kind of identities that are benefiting or whatever, mm. from identity politics or in a kind of grievance Olympics or whatever." And you're trying to put Jews in that, and I'm sort of not. I'm not doing that at all. But other people have said, "Oh, I like the book because it's." It's using Jews to break down the whole framework of identity politics. I don't think it's doing any of that. It's just my take on sure. how identity politics fails when it comes to Jews. So I think a lot of Jewish people as well, we're stuck, we, we saw that. Maybe we liked the idea of identity politics and we saw, hang on, well, we're sort of left out here. But then in hindsight, I started to think in hindsight, was it not inevitable that once humans started going, okay, this is we're going to really focus on whose identity is more important in a hierarchy, that Jews, for example, and maybe some others, would be left out and that would be a problem? Well, uh, I don't know. Um, is, it, is it a problem I, I, inherent I, I, to identity politics? Yeah. Um, maybe it is. Uh, I mean, so, so I... I think I was the first person to use, I may not have been, uh, to use the phrase hierarchy of racism. Mm. Uh, you now see it quite a lot, and it's always <coughs> condemned as an idea. And obviously, I, I was saying it's it's a problem. It's a problem if you've got a hierarchy of racism, uh, because, you know, you, you, you know, why should one type of racism be considered worse than another type of racism? But I was also saying... Um, because the book is an analysis, really, than anything else, this clearly exists. Because it must exist, because Jews are a category of people who have had racist violence enacted against them historically many times, and yet they seem to sit outside the concerns of the identity politicians. So therefore that must be because it's considered that something about Jews makes them less important mm -hmm. to be concerned about, right? So you're, you're probably right. However, I actually think that identity politics in general comes from a good place and a useful place, which comes down to what we said right at the start with the Andrew Doyle and Peter Bogosian thing about swapping places, which is, I think, unquestionably, it is true, and I think anti-woke people sometimes never consider this, it is true that until very recently, society in the West was really seen mainly just from one viewpoint which was a kind of white, mainly male, um, you know, I don't know if it, where it sits totally in terms of class. I think that's complicated. Uh, but certainly it was a, a very white bread mm. kind of sense of ourselves, of what, say, Britain was when I was growing up. Uh, you know, you, you never really saw people of colour on the TV. You never really saw 
you know, uh, different opinions, different ideas of who we were, different sense of what Britain was, uh, expounded and just lived, you know, represented, yeah. inclusion, all that stuff. And I think that the change is a good thing. Definitely, it's a good thing because it makes people empathise with, you know, people who are not them in a way that is real and organic and isn't just like, oh, I'm doing this for, you know, performance, performative reasons on social media. Yeah. Right? However, I think that historically, you can then say, okay, this has got to a point now where maybe there are some issues with it. Yeah, sort of pendulum going too far. Maybe, but also just like analysis of like, what does it mean? Where, where are we now with this good intention? This good intention, when I was growing up, where clearly there was just, you know, I didn't see myself represented. That's one of the things I say in Jews Don't Count. One of the things I say in Jews Don't Count is that um, the work of Jack Rosenthal, the Mitzvah Boy, which is a play mm. by Jack Rosenthal, uh, a really brilliant play, it was on play for today in like, I don't know, the early 80s. Uh, and it was the first time I had seen the British Jewish experience represented on mainstream TV. Just hadn't been on. It's like, oh God, that's a bit like my life, mm. right? Now, in terms of the pendulum, uh, when I think I mentioned this in uh, uh, BBC Four a few years ago, did a retrospective of Play for Today. It had many, many other examples of Play for Today later on, finding all sorts of minorities to celebrate and to include and to tell the British people that these people existed and had their own way of living, which is all good. It didn't mention Bermitsa Boy. Bermitsa Boy, which, which at the time was very celebrated, was mm. just not mentioned. Because it is not in the present narrative that Jewish inclusion and Jewish representation is part of what makes a diverse culture a good thing. Mm. It's, which is mad. I mean, do, I don't know if I told you the full story of when I, cause I started off making documentaries for the BBC mm. and uh, kept bringing them ideas after that. I, so I made a documentary about an exorcist in Argentina. The idea was I wanted to be a sort of Louis Theroux character who speaks different languages and then I can go to these different places and do all that stuff. And they loved the ideas after the exorcist film, but they said to me, at every production company, we can do this, but you're going to have to be off screen and we're going to have to get a minority on and basically pretend that they were the journalists doing this. Every production company said this to me. When was this? This was, so I was between about 20, 24 and 31, I say. So so I'm 34 now. So uh, I eventually had to give up. But in that time, after a few years, I remember saying to a couple of different people, well, you know, I am Jewish. That is that is a minority. If it is a box ticking exercise, if and I didn't want to do that because I wanted to get by on the merit of what I was making for them. Uh, and I, I remember one guy in particular was a producer who just laughed and he said, "If if I had to say what I really thought now, I don't think you'd like it." Hmm. And well, I know what he thought. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've heard you say that by the way. I heard yeah. you say it on trigonometry. Oh, you watched it? I watched just that bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, you know, I think, again, it's complicated because I actually agree uh, with uh, lots of people of colour and other minorities that they have been underrepresented in the media. But I think the notion of Jewish overrepresentation, which is what that guy meant, uh, I'm just going to, I know you haven't mentioned his name, so there's nothing libelous, but I know I come up uh, uh, against this quite a lot, is that people, particularly in this industry yes if we include this as part of the industry of yeah the, I'm, of, I'm there yeah so well, I've never liked the word industry in adaptation the film adaptation oh, yeah, uh, yeah. with Charlie um, Kaufman film yes yeah um, what a film in which Nicolas Cage plays two parts yes well his brother who's a writer uh, sorry the, one of the twins who's a writer and the other one the other one is always using the word industry to okay. describe it, and he said don't call it an industry Meaning it's not a fucking industry, <laughs> which relates to Alexi Sales thing that he used to say many years ago. Alexi Sales said, said uh, anything that calls itself a workshop that doesn't have sawdust on the uh, floor is shite. Well, I know um, how you feel about the monarchy and it causes off the firm, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, but let's move. Let's leave the monarchy out of it for the okay. minute. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, so, yeah, you get you have a notion of, sort of that the, the people. One of the many reasons in which people feel people who would otherwise be progressive and are interested in diversity and inclusion or whatever, uh, feel that they can exclude Jews is they feel Jews are powerful. That's basically the point. At the heart of it is Jews are powerful. And one of the notions of power, of Jewish power, is that, well, they're overrepresented in film and TV. Uh, they're certainly not in Britain. In Britain, like, tell me who they are in yeah. Britain. Like, for a start, who is Jewish and known to be Jewish on British TV apart from me? Mm -hmm. And 
Uh, Miriam Margulis and yeah. Simon Amstel, Stephen Fry. Well, Simon, Simon Amstel, Stephen Fry is obviously a good example. So Stephen, who was on my documentary and wrote me an unbelievably fantastic um, quote, which for Jews don't count when he first read it, and has sort of told me that he feels, you know, to some extent that his Jewish identity, uh, you know, was confirmed for him, that he, he felt more Jewish on reading Jews Don't Count, you know, when he chose to do uh, and was asked to do, which was an interesting thing, the Channel 4 alternative message, is that on social media, which is not the world, it's a really important thing, uh, on social media there was a sort of massive reaction to it. Now the massive reaction is to do with how people are choosing to look at Israel and Gaza, sure. but it's also to do with a more eternal thing, which is the very notion that Jewish as an identity, and as something that can claim vulnerability as an identity, can claim discrimination, can claim the status of other minorities, is sort of complicated and problematic and feels like, but aren't they too rich and powerful and posh to do this? Uh, and it's interesting, therefore, that Stephen started off by talking about how he was gay and uh, you know how he'd fought for gay pride all his life, and then sort of moved it on to the issue of Jewishness. Um, so I don't... I think that he's someone who only recently, and it's a very good thing, people might know that he was Jewish, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> um, yeah. And so in terms of, you know, there just aren't that many. I mean, for example, when I did Jews Don't Count the, as a documentary, which Louis Theroux uh, was the executive producer for, it's his production company, yeah. uh, we actually filmed a meeting, which is not in the documentary in the end, but we filmed a meeting where we talked about something, which is, so if this, this is a documentary about minority, right? This is me leading the meeting. If this was a documentary about any other minority, what would happen is Channel 4, and indeed, you know, just generally the television industry would say, well, you need quite a lot of people from that minority involved in that film. Otherwise, it'd be stupid and weird and, and wrong. But there were no, no other Jews around the table apart from me. That was it. There was about seven people in the room, no other Jews around the table. And so we, we tried to find uh, some other Jews to work on. It was really hard because mm. there aren't that many. Yeah, There aren't that many. And no. it was hard to find a Jewish. We didn't find a Jewish director. We found a, a Jewish guy who became one of the producers on it, which was good. That was it, really. Yeah. Well, speaking of not having many Jews around the table, Friday Night Dinner was a sitcom in the UK. And uh, again, there was a Jewish family. And, and I, I don't think any of them were Jewish, except one, one was maybe half Jewish. Well, no, I've, I've talked about this and, uh, you know, many, many times got into trouble. Oh. I say trouble, by which I mean social media hatred. It's not really trouble. You have to accept it as not actually trouble. It's just people on social media shouting. Uh, but about the... Uh, you know, one of the ways in which... I mean, that, that does fit in, by the way, which is like Jews dominate the media, Jews are in television and film, blah, blah, blah. And yet, one up, you know, the main point I'm making about non-Jews being cast as Jews is that it's just one of the many strictures that identity politics and a modern way of thinking have changed the way that we think about representation. Uh, and it's in, and I don't completely disagree with it, by the way. Like, I think when Marley Martin, is that her name? The woman in CODA, I may have got her name wrong, for which I apologise. But the, the actress who was in CODA, uh, she said, death is not a costume, right? Which is interesting because actors are thought of as wearing costumes. What she means is that I don't think death which is something very profound to her identity, is something that I want to see someone who's not deaf wear, put on, right? Because, and I think that's reasonable. I think it's reasonable. I think it's problematic as well. You have to think about it because what does that mean for actors? Yeah. But her point is, which I think is very interesting, is I think that there's a point at which acting for someone who is in that position, for someone who is disabled, feels like mimicry. And mimicry can very easily shade into mockery. Right, uh, and I sort of accept that that that's an issue. But so therefore now, say deaf, but deaf is not something that you generally see as represented on screen by someone who's not deaf. Jews all the time, all the time, uh, happens all the time. And my basic point is that's just another way which Jews are left out of the strictures of identity politics. And it's not, I have to say this a thousand times, it's not that I think uh, non-Jews can't play Jews. I think it. The issue is, what does it say about Jews in general that they are considered that they don't need that, that, that it's not necessary? But having said all that, to come back to your point, there's another thing, which is if Jews are all over the media, Jews dominate TV and film, they'd have been able to find Jewish actors, wouldn't they? Quite easily. 
yeah. for these TV shows and films with Jews in them. It yeah. wouldn't have been hard. In Oppenheimer, never mind Oppenheimer, Einstein, right, which is uh, played by... God, oh, fuck, it's gone. Mm. Um... A man who looks vaguely like Einstein. No, but we. I uh, know. I want to know. <laughs> no, so this is a senior moment. Um, I Tom don't Conti, right? He's played by Tom Conti, who some people think is Jewish, by the way, because like quite a lot of like Eddie Marsden and yes. like people think that there are some people who play Jews a lot, mm -hmm. but they are Jewish. Louis Theroux I mean, as well. Yeah. To be fair to Eddie Marsden, he's made it very clear that he's not. But Tom Conti is not Jewish. Einstein, I would say, is probably. I would say. I don't know if you think this as a Jew, mm -hmm. uh, is maybe the most iconic Jew ever. Well, yeah, yeah. I would say. I mean, uh, you know, like. You know, if you wanted to mention iconic members of other minorities, they're sort of, you know, probably more sort of empowering political well, figures, you, sort of. But I would say, if you ask me to name who I am most proud of at some level, even though it's complicated and it's always complicated with Jews because his discovery has led to atomic bombs, but I think, like, isn't it incredible that Einstein was Jewish because Einstein had insights that are up there with kind of Galileo and it's mm -hmm. extraordinary. But he's played by a non Jew. So there's a thing, that's a yeah. thing, which is like, if it was another minority and the most iconic member of that minority was played by somebody who's not a member of that minority, that would lead to internet outrage and possibly the film being brought down. Yeah. No chance of that with Jews. There's simply no chance of it. But also, it's not even the main part in that film. And you'd have thought you could find a Jew yeah. to play it. You should be able uh, to. Unless Jews don't dominate it. Just Unless the possibility <laughs> is Jews do not dominate those industries and are not overrepresented in them. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Um, with regards to Einstein, I was just thinking about this the other day because you know I've got this relationship with Argentina. Is that a problem? There's an African um, church, absolute nutcases who we didn't know. I don't think you should say that. Um, but well, they are. <laughs> I really don't think you should. <laughs> they're say evangelical. That. They're like they're doing all the speaking in tongues. They're nutcases. I mean, that, to me, that's a nutcase. I'm not, I, okay. I shouldn't have to not. Say, do you think I shouldn't? No, well, I don't know. I don't know them. I haven't been Apparently in. Apparently, they tried to run over the owner of this with their car. Um, okay. When they asked, like, when are you going to stop on this particular day? Or something. okay. So, so I don't know. Maybe we won't include that though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> also, you might get run over for, yeah, that's for find calling me first, them mate. nutcases. Well, then you're next door. <laughs> well, this <laughs> particular day, day I'm here. Them. I'm here today, mate. Come and get me. <laughs> yeah. um, Argentina, when they had the the, the dictatorship in the yeah, late seventies, early eighties, 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 yeah, Videla, uh, he would say to people, you know, we've got three enemies of, of Argentina: uh, Marx, Freud, and Einstein. Right. For various reasons, uh, you know, the Jews is what what they meant. Yes, yes, yes. No, well, that's that's true. And obviously, one of the things about that is that um, I, I think I some of this stick that I get on social media might come from a notion that by critiquing identity politics, it's seen as like, oh, I'm focusing mm. on the anti-Semitism, or I actually don't think I actually don't call it anti-Semitism. I tend to call it the Jews don't countenance, sure. which yeah. is slightly different from anti-Semitism. The Jews don't countenance implicit in on the left, uh, but actually, I'm doing something very specific there in a way, which is to say the direct threat to Jews. Right, it comes from other places generally. It comes from the far right. It still comes mainly from the far right. It also comes from Islamists, obviously. But it comes from the far right a lot of the time, the most extreme uh, massacres of Jews. So the most extreme massacre of Jews in America uh, over the last few years is the killing of 11 Jews in Pittsburgh in 2018 by a far right gunman, interestingly radicalised on Gab, Mm. Uh, which, as you'll know, no, yeah, you do. How Gab. do you not know that? Gab is this, I don't know if it still exists, but it was this social media site that uh, very far-right people generally went to right. at the point in time before Elon Musk took over when Twitter mm. was seen as a place where that kind of opinion might be shut down. Obviously, okay. that is not the case anymore. Uh, but he was on Gab. Um, he believed in the... Um, uh, replacement theory, the Great Replacement well, Theory, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're, the Great Replacement Theory is incredibly live and active, particularly in America, and at the heart of it, for anyone who doesn't know, your viewers will know, I think, mm -hmm. it's a belief that Jews are secretly ma masterminding immigration and multiculturalism in order to undermine the sure. DNA of the Aryan white races in order to take over the world. Obviously, it's utter bollocks and fits in with the protocols of the Elders of Zion and many other things. But he killed 11 Jews in Pittsburgh. Uh, this far-right gunman, and my point is that the the sort of IRL danger of the Jews don't count position is that it's neglectful at a time of rising far-right antagonism towards Jews. Now, it's complicated in all sorts of ways, but if 
the basic idea of the progressive allyship conceit is we are a sanctuary, right? We are a place where minorities can feel welcome and not under threat, but we don't really care about Jews, then that's the problem because Jews are under threat. Mm. I feel like Jews might be a litmus test for when an ideology is going wrong. Yeah. And, and I think I think you're right about, I mean, obviously, the, the, it's almost to me like I don't focus too much on the right because it's so obvious to me mm. that it's awful. I don't talk about Trump because I just think, what call it, oh, I can call Trump an idiot. Or what's mm. the, you know, how easy is that? Mm. Whereas some of the left stuff is more insidious. It's more mm. friends of mine at university yeah. who are really going for it. And we've gotten to a point right now where, you know, as we know recently, there are three presidents of universities who just said that calling for genocide of Jews is uh, not against harassment and bullying rules there or, or whatever, which is absurd. And then people say, oh, well... well that's it, not what exactly happened, though. It's not... So you, you mentioned this to okay. me that we might talk about this, and I said oh, I will have to speak about it for fifteen minutes. It, I, I think I said oh, to contextualise it. Sure. So I'm going to have to contextualise it because the truth, and that's all I'm interested in, right? Okay. All I'm interested in, and this, I, mean, I guess everyone might feel that 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 is all they're interested in. I don't know. I, I don't know. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> I am only interested in truth. Yeah. Uh, and what I find with truth more and more, particularly as social media. Uh, makes truth blurry because it's social media is more interested in preconceived ideological truths okay set shouted from whichever f silo they're shouted from uh but i am interested in what is that the actual truth tends to be in the detail and the detail of that particular thing is that what actually happened was was that elise stefan nick i think that's her name the mm -hmm. republican senator yeah uh was talking before the clip that I put on social media. I put this clip on social media, the one that everyone saw, and I said, Jews don't count, and it got 11,000 yeah. likes and whatever. Uh, uh, she uh, was talking specifically about chance of, I think, globalize the intifada. Sure. Uh, and that's very important, by the way, because, well, I'll come back to why that's important, but she was talking about chance of globalize the intifada. Uh, and then she said, and this is where the video sort of appears, uh, you know, that's a call for the genocide of Jews, and, you know, you're allowing that to happen. Why? And why don't you call, call that harassment and bullying? Uh, and since then, the pushback against that, the push for all three presidents who, who responded in the way they did, has been, oh, that was deliberate muddying by that Republican senator, who sure. is a big Trump pro-Trump, MAGA, 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 whatever you pronounce yeah. it. Uh, that was a deliberate MAGA of her in order to put those progressive presidents in a difficult position. Because because the pushback says that intifada just means struggle, right? That's it just a, means, yeah. hang on, let me, I, I'm so across this, right? Intifada just means struggle. And so therefore saying that it means uh, it's calling somehow for the genocide of, genocide of Jews is a deliberate right wing muddying of the situation. So here's the problem, right? There's a number of things there. Number one, well, I don't understand why none of them said, I don't accept, in, in the bit that actually is on video, I don't accept that globalise the intifada or calling right. for intifada means genocide of Jews. I don't accept that. I don't accept your position, therefore I'm not going to accept that. And, and then say, of course, a straightforward calling for the genocide of Jews. Yes. we would say was unacceptable, but we don't accept that calls for intifada is that. I don't know why none of them did that. Well, that's right. what I'm wondering. That's well, what I think the same. I know the context. Well, but, but, they, well, but you didn't put it just but, now. But they were, it's really because, important. Because they were still asked afterwards, over and over again, specifically, is specifically calling for the genocide of the Jews against your policy? That was the question. These are smart people. Yeah, well, as far as I could make out, Mm. And I don't fucking know because it's. You know, <laughs> but as far as I can make out, they were all worried about the legal yes. position that they were in, and I think they were also worried about something else, which is all those people were progressive people. Uh, they have a student body who want to protest, want to do pro-Palestinian protests. Sure. They don't want to be limited in what they can chant, and so therefore they were trying to weave away through the legalistic net th stuff of that, the question they were being asked, and the idea of like, oh, we've got this you know, student body that we don't want to sort of get get ourselves wrong with. And so they sort of ignored the fact that the question they were being asked was clearly like, no, well, obviously we can't accept that. But they don't, none of them do that. So there's something else I need to say, which I don't think anyone else has said, and I could well be wrong, is I've seen lots of people, and there was an article in The Guardian recently, and I've seen lots of people on the internet say, intifada just means struggle, and so therefore 
yeah. Elise Stefaniak was being contrived and insidious by smearing those two things, by joining up those two things, by saying... So, firstly, of course, that's disingenuous because Intifada may just mean struggle, but also it relates specifically to two examples mm. of... Uh, you know, conflict well, struggle, in the Middle East. The conflict word struggle in, with the historic connotations in particular. No, but specifically, but conflict in the Middle East has involved camps. two inter intifadas that have involved the killing of Jews, as, yeah, as well right. as obviously the killing of Palestinians. Yes. You know, so that's what they relate to. That's, mine mine that, struggle. Yeah, well, that's also true. Uh, but I am more interested in the word globalise. That's what oh, I think okay. is amazing that no one's talked about this. As far as I can make out, I could be wrong, right? Is that like all the argument has been like, oh, Intifada doesn't mean this Intifada. But yeah, the word globalise is the one I find more problematic because globalise, something that's happening in the Middle East, is what I have a problem with and what I've always <laughs> had a problem with yeah. as regards like the status of Jews. Because as far as I'm concerned, it is not the case with most struggles, most awful conflicts happening miles and miles and miles away from where that minority lives or whatever, that therefore you are you have a free license to attack that minority because of that struggle. Now, I'm not saying that is exactly what happens. It isn't exactly what happens with all sorts of, you know, pro Palestinian activity. But obviously there is a lumping together and it's particularly happening at the moment of Jews in general with what's happening in the Middle East. Yeah. Right? And it seems to me that calling calls for globalizing, globalizing the Intifada mm. is a way of justifying or certainly can lead to justification of attacks on Jews elsewhere. And th in those terms, I think that's sort of nothing to do with the incredibly tiresome American politics behind the ways in which that moment's been interpreted. Mm. It's interesting. There's no globalized struggle against the Chinese for what's no. happened to the U Uyghur, exactly. Uyghur Muslims. Really bizarre that it's just on the Jews. But yeah. but this is an example, I think, of why the left is just as dangerous as the right for Jews in this in this instance. Uh, it might be. I mean, um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I yeah. you know, I, I. What I'm trying to prove here is how complex that situation is. The, the, the central thing, again, that needs to be understood, which, sorry, moving on a, a little bit, but not that much, mm. is, I don't know if you saw the SNL sketch. Yes. So the SNL sketch did something that was interesting, but also quite depressing from a sort of Jewish point of view, in that it made the object of satire entirely the Republican yes. senator, who was sort of like a shrill, shrieking, mad person. Uh, in saying, do you condemn the genocide of Jews, yeah. right? Uh, or the the idea that genocide of Jews, and that's interesting because that comes back to the teams thing that I think the people mm -hmm. who write SNL because cannot imagine that a Republican, a particular Trumpist Republican, could not be the clown, yeah. the crazy person in this situation. But here's the most important thing, and I've said this a few times, and I've said it in Jews Don't Care, whatever, is weaponization of anti-Semitism by the right does happen. So weaponization of anti-Semitism by the right, yeah. which happens all the time as an accusation, especially on social media. There's this constant thing of like, uh, you know, oh, it's all been trumped up by the Tories or it's all been trumped up by the Republicans or whatever. Uh, and Trump was not meant to be a pun there. No. <laughs> um, I, it, here's the thing. It does happen. I think there, there's an example in my book. Uh, where Matt Hancock, of all people, uh, I was watching him, this was on social media a few years ago, there was a film of him talking about the NHS and he was struggling, he was in real problems and so he just started going on about Jeremy Corbyn and anti-Semitism and the crowd, who were mainly left-wing and or people who work for the NHS, get really angry and it's obviously a stupid card that he's playing. It's obviously that. I don't believe Matt Hancock cares about Jews. No, right? or much else. Or much, right. Mm -hmm. But... So, when people watch that, they think like, oh yeah, you know, that's that's just a sort of pawn, that's a political card he's playing. If a Jew watches it, you think two things. You think that's a card he's playing, and the sound of those people shouting furiously, so angry about the very idea that anti-Semitism might be a thing, is frightening. Mm. They are a mob who the word anti-Semitism has led to them going very getting very very angry so this is what needs to be understood right that republican senator 
was probably weaponizing anti-Semitism. Sure. I don't know that much about her, but she seems to come from a position of, like, you know, being very anti all sorts of woke ideas and would be anti all those presidents for all sorts of other things to do with abortion and all sorts of things that they think and whatever. That does not make the anti-Semitism involved in not really being that concerned about whether or not a call for genocide to Jews should be something that you should very, very strongly oppose. That doesn't mean it is non-existent. Yeah. Both things are true. It can be weaponized from the right and it can be ignored by the left at the same time. And anti-Semitism as an issue should not be smeared, which is what happens all the time, by the idea of like, oh, but this is what the Tories or this is what the right wing care about. This is the right, this is the racism, this is the discrimination they care about. So therefore, it is meaningless. That's a jump that the left make that is yeah. deeply problematic. I agree with you. I completely agree. But and the, the other thing with weaponization, I, we're always hearing that, oh, that's just being weaponized. I mean, that is what politics is. They are supposed to see the faults in the other side and then go at them and try and get people on their side for that. I mean, that's just what happens. And unfortunately, on the left, there clearly has been a lot of anti-Semitism. And the right, of course, they're going to use that. Why, yes. why, there is an open goal. Yes. Why wouldn't they do that? So, yeah, well, yes. But also, there has. And there's also, there are examples of the right inflating it sure but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist yeah. it's part of again comes down to like you know if you ask me what i have as a mantra as any kind of you know motto to live by it is the truth is always complex which it is it almost always is even things that we would like to think of about good and evil as like even that idea of victimizers and victimized is an idea of good and evil but that's not simple it's complicated and the truth is complicated and that's one of the ways in which it is most simplified on social media is like oh well if the right wing in any way sort of apply that process to this issue the issue vanishes and that's not true i think that that's a big problem with identity politics and i know i understand that intersectionality when it first came about was was supposed to be a lot more nuanced and it was this idea that uh there's a difference between how a black man in a factory is treated and paid and a black woman right so you have to look at not just race but gender and how everything interacts together to understand all these complex things but i'm not sure that humans are capable of really applying that in such a nuanced and balanced way and that's what's led to a lot of binary thinking that's why i would i would just dismantle the identity politics i think that's where the left personally where the left going wrong uh, i think it's leading to more divisiveness i think it's led to what happened with those presidents um I, well i would say i wouldn't completely at all mm. i mean i would say that one of the i think i Sorry, I've said a couple of times. Hmm. Uh, I think I said this in, and that's probably a bit annoying. No. Uh, it, Mike Yarwood, who died recently, uh, who you won't know about, but he was a big impressionist in the 1970s. Hmm. He used to do an impression of uh, James Callaghan, the Labour Party right. Prime Minister, and his catchphrase was, I think I said this at the Brighton Conference. Right. And it was supposed to show what an old buffer he was. And I feel that when I say, <laughs> I think I said this. Uh, yeah. um, in, in, in Jews don't count. Uh, but I think... Um, I think that the that it is important to see that the gains of those of those things are a thing, right? It's a it's a real thing to feel that you have been not included, not represented, and that your way of looking at the world has not been seen, right? But I so I don't completely agree with you about the dismantlement. What I do say in it is that you get a strange fragmentation of what the left is. So the left used to be very much about class and economics. Yes and a sort of old style of politics. And the idea that, I mean, I could be wrong about this, but it seems to me that I don't know where that is now in left-wing politics. I don't know where a focus on, you know, the obvious inequities in our economic system and the class system, it, it doesn't seem to be focused on, that may be unfair, by the way, that might just be the way the media mm -hmm. is, but it doesn't seem to be focused on. So the shift, in what it means to be progressive. And progressive itself does that, doesn't it? Because I would say progressive as a word means something different from left wing. And what's the difference? Sure. Left wing, in my mind, in my old 59-year-old mind, left wing implies that you are bothered about things like trade unions and yes. you know uh, work regulations and how to make things better for the vast majority of people in any country in the world who are economically deprived. That seems to be the... But progressive seems to mean something else. 
which is that those ideas of deprivation or of non-inclusion and non-representation are not certainly not only economic yeah yeah i think that's that was a big change uh, yeah. personal so, but, uh, but in terms of your dismantlement i'm i don't know i don't know and I, one of the things know, about intersectionality sorry now we're yeah. sort of is like one of the, i think one of the problems with intersectionality is about how it can just stop things getting done like it seems to me that you know there are many still many types of injustice in the world but if movements towards stopping that injustice have to constantly put a break on themselves to say oh yeah but it's different for this person or it's mm -hmm. different for that person whose experience of this injustice is not the same as yours i mean that's probably true but at the same time it can just mean that you don't get anything done i mean that's when the left gets into the narcissism of small differences yes you've heard that phrase yeah right? yeah, yeah it's a freudian phrase right yeah, um, yeah it's a belief that you know you, and it happens on social media all the time uh, in which like this thing, this small difference between the way I think and the way that you think, or indeed the way that I am and that you are, means I cannot completely ally with you in this cause, which could be a just cause. Mm -hmm. But then you're just spending all your time arguing about the small difference. I think that's why, for example, JK Rowling gets a harder time uh, when she says things that are not along with the trans ideology because she's seen as someone who is already quite centre or centre left. Uh, she was very sort of, she made Dumbledore gay. She's very f feminist and those, they get a really hard time with maybe Ricky Gervais, like people don't care as much because it's like, oh, he's a different kind of thing. It's the narcissism of small differences. I wonder as well if you and I, we grew up in slightly different, you know, this very, very similar in many respects, but also different societies. So I grew up in the twenties. Quite a lot younger than me. I'm quite a bit, I'm a bit younger. No, you're 34, you, just, you said, I'm 59. Yeah, but at the same time, we grew up in um, North London, similar schools, that kind of thing. Uh, but what was different was by the time I was sort of looking at TV and things like that. We were at a place where uh, black people in the UK were uh, doubly overrepresented compared to like the national population. White men are underrepresented. Um, and oh, I can't think I had loads of other ones as well. Like, right. Free school meals. Uh, free school meals schools. There's the poorest schools in the country. Uh, the white kids do worse, significantly, much, much worse than people from different minorities and things like that. So I've grown up in that, that kind of world going, well, hang on, I'm not so sure. Whereas the world you described before, where it really does seem like there was a... Pro what I'm getting at is it feels like VAR in football, where right. you drink something in, but you just... They obviously did it so, so like, oh, vehemently and over the top at the beginning. I, mean, I don't know if that's true. Sorry, I don't wish to be. Okay. I don't wish to be on you, this podcast, which is let's disagree. Its identity has become quite anti woke, I think, and be woke. That's, that's true. Uh, well, I, well. I have a problem with the whole word uh, and what it means, but that's I okay. I don't think it was brought in. No, it feels to me like, in a way, when I wrote Jews Don't Count, mm. uh, I was talking about an accretion of opinion towards identity, towards identity politics, towards righting the apparent wrongs of identity, towards making it better that people were included and represented and, you know, cared about. That seemed to have happened over about 25 years to me. I mean, I first started writing, I think it was in 2002, I wrote a piece about the Y word. Uh, yes. Which uh, is about this thing that people will probably know, some people, uh, which is the chanting of the word yid at football matches. Um, I wrote a piece about how it seemed weird to me in 2002 that 40,000 people at Chelsea, right, would still be chanting an obviously anti-Semitic word and various anti-Semitic slogans off the back of it, when surely in 2002, this was not a context where such stuff was acceptable. I think I wrote that piece for The Independent. And then over the course of the next 20 years, it became obvious to me that the uh, context for that was a very, very, very uh, definite attempt to eradicate racism in football and across society that Jews were still being left out. But it seemed to me to be, you know, I don't know about bringing it in bang in the way that you've said. That's why I'm disagreeing with it. It seems to me to be... Uh, quite a slow process, but one that has definitely taken hold. Okay, then I would say one that in, in my mind has gone too far. I, I don't, it doesn't feel like, uh, it doesn't feel healthy to me to have a situation where somebody is being told like I, like I was. And I know it's my personal experience. Obviously, I'm affected by it and it's a personal thing. But to be told you can't do this job because you're white. And I, I don't think that helps necessarily racial divisions in in a country i don't i just don't see how that's and that to me is when it's gone too far and i don't i hate saying it's yeah. gone too see, far my, my issue with that is that you are jewish mm -hmm. right and so i am much more interested in i mean obviously there is a 
conversation to be had. It's sort of not the conversation I'm having generally. Uh, and I'm always, it always sort of pisses me off in a way when Jews get involved in that conversation. Now, not that I'm pissed off with you, but that I am pissed off with is there's a financier, you may know about this, called Bill Ackman. Yes. Who's Jewish and a billionaire or whatever. He was one of the people who was very, very, you know, I don't know what he was actually doing. He seemed to be writing mainly on Twitter about it, which, by the way, I'm going to keep calling Twitter because I don't want to call it yeah, X. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, um, <laughs> but he was writing 4,000 word, clearly he's got the blue tick, uh, <laughs> screams on Twitter against Claudine Gay. And one of the, and he was going on about anti-white racism, anti-white racism, blah, blah, blah. And he's Jewish. Yeah. Right? Now, I generally, in the way that I think about anti-Jewish racism, uh, just intellectually, it involves... Jews always not completely owning the identity white uh, because one of the big big problems with the way that Jews are seen by progressives is as sort of very white uh, I've said this loads of times but yeah. um, you know when that mural uh, that Jeremy Corbyn supported was taken down and the artist Mir One his name is Mir One got very angry about that he posted on Facebook oh I see some old white Jewish folk yeah. have got angry about my depictions of their beloved hashtag Rothschild hashtag Warburg. I mean, it's an extraordinary <laughs> sentence. Uh, in all, and hashtag's important in, in it because, yeah. because that means you can click on it and go into all sorts of conspiracy theory about Jews. But the most important word in that sentence is white. It's positioning Jews as white and therefore not in what I call the sacred circle of minorities that we have to care about and as progressives we are concerned mm. about and therefore it means they are powerful and blah, blah, blah. So... It's a conversation which is interesting. You saying, you know, there's anti-white racism and as a white person I wasn't allowed to make these programs. It's kind of not interesting to me mm -hmm. because I see you as Jewish and I'm much more interested in the moment where you said, but I'm Jewish. And the guy said, yeah, I, I'm kind of laughing at that and I don't even want to tell you what I think. That that's, was a horrible moment for me. That's what interests me in, the, in that less the idea that you couldn't make these programs because you were white. Mm, that was very um, sad for me. It really hurt. No, it's horrible. It was painful. It's horrible and you should own it in a way. As a, you should own it as a moment of anti-Jewish racism. Well, I do. But for me, I guess because I want the whole thing dismantled, I, I agree with you 100% that, that, about what you're saying about Jews, Jews not being included. I just think I don't want any... I, yeah, Jews are not included in minorities. I, I know that, and I, I've always known that. You, no, but I accept... You're saying, I think I'm more woke than you. I accept that unconscious bias yeah. exists towards other minorities. I'm prepared to accept that I mm. show unconscious bias to other minorities. And I grew up at a time when unquestionably there was bias but against that's, other minorities. Now, it may have been different for you, but I yeah. still feel it, right? What I think is that I am very concerned about how an acknowledgement of un unconscious bias that I might make or any other Jew might make is not reflected back to them as a Jew. Yeah. Right? I agree with that. I, and I, I actually do... So the I idea do... that non-Jews carry yeah. all sorts of unconscious biases towards Jews, just as a white person might carry all sorts of unconscious bias towards people of colour, right? Progressives are very happy with the second part of that sentence. <laughs> They're not happy with the yeah. first part. Well, you and I, we could trade war stories for hours, couldn't about about being treated badly by left what well, people who are very progressive uh, for being Jewish. That's part of as well why I thought, you know what, I can't have the whole thing. I think is just bollocks. I think it's bollocks, and I think it's people who See, want I, to. Feel... I don't really agree with that. I don't think no, the I whole know. thing is bollocks. I know. I think I think the whole thing is complicated and flawed. Yeah and maybe in some ways has gone too far. Obviously, we could all find examples of where it's sure. gone too far or whatever. But I I wrote Jews Don't Count. I mean, it's a few years ago where things probably had gone slightly less far. But I wrote Jews Don't Count as a progressive. As I say in it, it probably includes me. I don't know if I would say that anymore because I'm so much keener on this idea of individual like thinking in, in like not in any way, same sure. way. But I say, you know, it probably includes me. Um, and therefore, I'm critiquing it from the point of view of I basically think this is a good idea to have concern mm. for people who are not the majority culture, but for some reason it's missing out this, my own minority, and why is that? And you can, if you want, and maybe sometimes I want to, not always, I change, but sometimes you, I can take that thread, right, like it's a thread in a jumper or whatever, and pull it, and the whole identity politics construction falls away. Maybe I mean, the metaphor went wrong then because no, that's it was how a, I feel. It was a jumper yeah. and then it was a building, right? <laughs> but but the, but you can do that. Yeah. But I don't. I don't. I'm not like you. I think I don't really want to do that. I think there are good things in it. 
Okay. Yeah. What I think is fundamentally because I think all all ideologies, uh, you know, the Nazis. Let's go. Okay. Do you, do you think this is an interesting? The Nazis. We have to go to the Nazis. Okay. I'm not saying why people are Nazis. It's different. Move. Yeah, that's a different thing. Don't say that. However, don't say anyone's <laughs> Nazis except the Nazis. Well, I'm talking about the Nazis. I'm, I'm curious because I had a nice philosophical uh, chat last night with a philosopher, Alex O'Connor. Did Hitler, irrelevant to it, I'm just just interested in this in, in itself, think he was doing evil and bad? No, no, of course not. I wrote a song, which uh, I think it's a shame it wasn't in it. Uh, I did a movie called The Infidel, which is about a Muslim who discovers he's born Jewish with Omid Jalili in it. It's a very mm. funny film. Do yeah. go and watch it. I haven't seen it yet. You I should, mean to, but Omid's brilliant, isn't he? Yeah, Omid's well, fantastic yeah. in it. Yeah. Um, uh, it's an interesting premise in terms of the casting thing because Omid is a Baha'i. Right, so you uh, could say, in terms of authenticity casting, that he's not right for either a Muslim or a Jew. Uh, <laughs> but given that he's an ambiguous character ethnically, he's a Muslim who was born a Jew, and a Baha'i is believe that all forms of uh, religion are chapters of the same book, then he's kind of perfect for it. So I wrote a musical yep. uh, version of the Infidel, and there was a song in that which I wrote with Aaron Baron Cohen, who was the composer, uh, called "Everyone Bad Thinks That They're Good." It was okay. a very straightforward uh, song, and we mentioned Hitler and a bunch of others, Pol Pot uh, and Stalin and whoever else. Uh, it is almost always the case. I, I would be amazed, and this is part of the problem with the whole, you know, uh, simplicity, good and bad, simplicity, good and evil thing. I would be amazed if there's a single tyrannical, despotic figure uh, in history who at some level doesn't believe that what they're doing is for the betterment mm. of the... I mean, Hitler, without any doubt, Hitler very much thought, what I'm going to say at the front of his head, uh, <laughs> thought that killing Jews would make it for a better world. I mean, clearly he thought that. Yeah. Uh, clearly Hitler did not think that he was a villain. Clearly he thought that history, you know, had he won the war, would have gone on to glorify him and the Thousand Year Reich. It's very, it's slightly complex with the Nazis, actually, because um, I did a program about a documentary about um, Holocaust denial. Mm -hmm. And I quote at one point, I say the first Holocaust deniers were the Nazis uh, because they destroyed evidence yeah. of the camps. And before that, um, Himmler does a speech to S to the SS, in which he says uh, something like, this is a glorious chapter in our history which will never be written. So there's this sort of, and again, this is about complexity, this sort of subconscious understanding there that it is shameful, but a resistance to it at the same time. Or that the others will think it's bad, even though we know yes, it's good. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's correct. There's a sense in there at the corners of his understanding that the world is going to condemn this, but we know it was the right thing to do. That's right. And I think that is a position that a lot of people think and almost treasure, mm -hmm. perhaps, that they're the ones. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what conspiracy theorists do. Yes. The idea of, like, you know, the world is against me and that bolsters my own self-image. Yeah. Yeah. I think I have a very nihilistic view of the world. And I right. think humans, when they can, will, in great numbers, do really horrible things things will commit atrocities i agree with that and so given the chance so that's why i think we have to be really careful and I, I know you agree with this as well with with our ideologies that seem like they're good and i actually do agree with you that there is unconscious bias um, against all sorts of minorities i definitely think that's a thing my concern is by trying as a large group to to affect that and make things perfect mm. We're going to have to employ some authoritarian measures yeah. and leave some people out. Mm. It's not just Jews no, I, as well. I agree with that. Um, Nihal has been talking. I, I, I don't. I don't want to pronounce his last name in case I get it wrong. Do you know Nihal. I know. I know him well. He's interviewed me many times. Can you say his? Last I, don't, I don't. I can't know. But Nihal I, has been talking about Asians. Uh, you know, not many Asians at the BBC. And I did look at the stats and. There, there, there do seem to be on screen Asians. It's about as many as in the population, but it, compared to uh, black people of, I think, African descent, it, it, it's um, you know they are overrepresented much more. Uh, there are no stats for Jews, of course, but maybe Nihal can feel now like, well, hang on, why aren't we as overrepresented? And I just feel it leads to this real, as, as you've coined it as well, hierarchy of of, of race and, and yeah. Oppression. I mean, well, so again, that's not an area that I'm going to. Sure. Take the bait in, but but I agree with you basically that social engineering. Well, I agree with you two ways without completely taking the bait of what you want me to say. Uh, that social engineering um, to try and make a world somehow free of unconscious bias towards minorities, in which everyone's included and represented, or whatever, is a sort of utopian idea, and almost definitely will lead to 
things that are not true and not real and possibly destructive. Um, so that's definitely correct. You're right about that. Apparently, all forms of, of sort of top-down social engineering have have problems. The other thing is, I think within minorities, uh, there should be there there is complexity and there is difference. And you know, so for example, I interviewed this uh, woman called Aisha Akanbi. Do you know who she is? For my no. social media documentary. No, no. So Aisha Akanbi is this brilliant. Um, she's of Nigerian descent. Uh, stylist who says like unbelievably clever kind of haikus mainly on Twitter on social media but a lot of them uh, if you break them down are I don't know if this is entirely fair to her whether she would agree with but I think she would a sort of anti-woke um, and what they're calling for is sort of you know individual com complex understandings of the societies in which we find ourselves rather than the imposition of huge blocks of humanity are this or that or whatever and we need to treat them like this or that or whatever rather than thinking well there might be very big differences in the way that she perceives that situation or someone else perceives that situation and that I think is something that happens I think that mm -hmm. you know there's something patronizing about the idea that all minorities <laughs> Uh, can be categorised as X, Y, or Z by a sort of betterment sure. idea. I agree with that. And without their cultures taken into consideration. Yeah, you know, what, cultures what and individuals someone, and ways yeah. of thinking and all the rest of it. One example of that is... I mean, one example, right? Oh, one yeah, example on. is, and I, I've never said who this is, uh, and it, it's complicated who it is, but anyway, uh, when I first um, talked about the Y word, a very progressive friend of mine... Uh, said to me, because in the film that we made, me and my brother made a film, uh, we used footballers from many different minorities talking about how the N-word and the mm -hmm. B-word had been eradicated. Ledley King was in it. Ledley King was in it, absolutely. Ledley King, Gary Lineker was in it. Yeah. Um, and all sorts of other people were in it, including a woman footballer. Mm. Um, and it began with Ledley King saying there used to be a word beginning with N that people used to chant at me, they don't do it anymore, right? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I mean, obviously, it might happen, unfortunately, in a few places, but generally that would be the case. Uh, and then uh, an Asian footballer talks about the P word and whatever, and then uh, I think it's Frank Lampard yeah. who says that But there's a word beginning with Y that you can hear all the time, and then you cut to people chanting the Y word. Uh, and so that is how that film began. And then a very progressive friend of mine said, but the Y word isn't as bad as the N word and the P word. And by the way, the whole Jew don't count mentality can perhaps be summed up in that statement, mm. right? Because you and I said why, and he said because Jews are rich, and he said it very wow. breezily, very breezily. Like we all know this to be true, right? We all know this to be true, and we all know. And so there's a thousand things wrong with that, you know, the idea that abuse of Jews is okay, right? Because of this imagined status, the idea that Jews are rich, which isn't in fact borne out by the statistics or whatever. But even if they were, that somehow that should allow for racist abuse. There's all sorts of things wrong with it. But one other thing that's wrong with it is the idea that black and brown people can never be rich. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like that's incredibly patronising. It's horrific. Yeah. I agree. I I wonder. I'm just thinking now. Like if I got really upset with the left, a progressive friend recently uh, who's did a similar thing. And I don't think I'd have been as bothered by someone who was more open to making fun of. I mean, okay, what I want to ask is, can you? is there room to make fun of people's identities? Because there sort of was, and maybe that can lead to bad stuff. But also on the other side, you know, this was a guy who said these things to me. He just kept, said a few things every time we went for lunch or whatever. He was just like, oh, yeah, you're not going to pay, are you? That kind of thing. Right. right? It so happened. I wasn't paying. No, I wasn't paying. <laughs> but um, he was making those kind of... And I thought, if that was someone else, it would still annoy me. Because I think, oh, it's so boring joke. What a boring joke you've said. But okay. But because it was somebody who I know is so sensitive to every other minority, that's what really, that's what hurt me. Was he a member of a minority? No. Okay. American. Okay. No. That's not a minority. No. Um, <laughs> well, so, well. So, so there's a key point there, really key point, which is you said it's kind of a boring joke. And you said that in passing as if like, you know, that's not the key issue, but that is the key issue. Mm. The key issue is not the joke. Not the fact that he was making jokes about a minority, it's the nature of the joke. So people get very, very animated about jokes. So you can't make jokes about X, Y, and Z. You can't make jokes about the Holocaust. You can't make jokes about minorities or whatever. Uh, it is difficult to make jokes about other minorities that are not your own now. I think that is difficult, and I'm, you know, there's a whole conversation to be had about whether you can or you can't. But the more important thing is, what does the actual joke say? 
And that joke says that Jews are mean. Right, Jews are mean, and that is not something that is a malign idea of Jews, a racist idea of Jews, and that is not a joke that should be, you know, given as license to be said by someone who's not Jewish. I mean, I don't say I don't. I used to. So here's the thing, right? I used to do this joke, which is quite a good joke, and I'm slightly sad to lose it from my repertoire. It's a good because it's a good joke, but this is it. It's, it said I haven't had a friend, which is true, a best friend who became a Buddhist, but he was Jewish to begin with, so he was like half Jewish, half Buddhist, which is someone who believes you should renounce all your material possessions but still keep the receipts, right? And right. it used to get a big laugh, and I stopped doing it because I thought I should stop doing jokes, even as a Jew, which are about how mm. you know we are mean, because unfortunately the association of Jews with money because Jews are rich, as my progressive friend said, has led to all sorts of problems for Jews. At the end of the line, it leads to Jews' houses being burned down. However, I do do this joke, which is there is an Englishman, a Frenchman, and a Jew sat on a park bench, and the Englishman says, I'm so tired and thirsty, I must have beer. And the Frenchman says, I'm so tired and thirsty, I must have wine. And the Jew says, I'm so tired and thirsty, I must have diabetes. <laughs> and and, and I, think, I think that joke plays on another stereotype of Jews, yeah. but the point is it's not a malign one, no. right? I don't think anyone's burnt down any Jews' houses because some Jews are hypochondriacs, mm. right? And so I think that's okay. Yeah, right? I'm sitting so, here rubbing my hands because they're cold, thinking something, what happens if they get too cold, <laughs> yeah, as yeah. you said that. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a Gervais one about the Holocaust. I, I don't know if he, they, but I, I can't Is it the one he stole from me? Maybe, you had to be there? Yeah, he stole. Well, Do I you say, want to tell he, that? He, oh, stole, no, he did stole from me, and it annoys me that Ricky did that. He's he, your mate, isn't he? He's my mate. Yeah, he's my mate, but he did do a thing, uh, which was on... Uh, Seinfeld. He's on Seinfeld's Coffee with Cars, Coffee with Comedians in Cars. I think, I haven't actually seen it, but people have told me. Yes. So he, I mean, I say it's, it's not my joke, because that's not <laughs> true. I heard it yeah. from a Jewish academic called Devorah Baum, who's a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they were discussing whether or not on Ricky and Jerry's show whether uh, they could you could do jokes on the Holocaust and he mentioned this one what annoys me is that he didn't say uh, you know, this is purely shallow he didn't yeah. say I heard this joke from David Baddiel because he definitely did can you tell uh, that? yeah the joke is uh, it's a good example of a Holocaust joke uh, that you can definitely tell because the idea that you can't tell jokes about the Holocaust you have to deconstruct the individual joke so this joke is beautiful uh, so after the war a Holocaust survivor dies of natural causes, uh, goes to heaven. When he gets to heaven, God asks the survivor to tell him a Holocaust joke. So the survivor does. The survivor tells God a Holocaust joke. And God says, that's not funny. And the survivor says, well, I guess you had to be there. Mm. And what I love about that joke is, A, obviously, it's not a dehumanizing Holocaust joke, of which there are many, right? Uh, and it also is very profound as an atheist because it says something which is like you know, I don't believe in God but if I did believe in God I might have that belief well, taken away from me uh, by the <laughs> years 39 to 45 I mean there's a much simpler version of it actually which is that Larry David brilliantly uh I mean, I don't know if I should tell this joke well, okay it's your show so I will tell it but yeah. just to make it clear this is a terrible not him he's this what he did was great but on the same show Harriet Harman I'm not going to tell the joke. The joke is a good example of a joke I think I shouldn't tell. But Harriet Harman, who was trying to, on this week, you remember that used to be on with Andrew yeah. Neal, she was trying to talk about jokes and what jokes you can't tell. And she chose a Holocaust joke. Uh, I'm just going to tell the setup. And the setup was how do you get um, 100 Jews in a mini metro, mm. right? And I'll leave it to you okay. what the answer was, but it you know, involved the ashtray, yeah. right? Um, and actually, Andrew Neal said, don't tell anymore. That's horrible. And it's an interesting moment because she was trying to say, but some jokes are horrible, and even in the telling, she was shut down, whatever. Anyway, in the same week, I remember, same week, Larry David hosted SNL, uh, and he did a whole bit, uh, firstly, incredibly edgily, about how some of the names who were being Me too at the time, the big names, were Jewish, right, and how he found that difficult, but he talked about it. It's really kind of extraordinary. But then he said, but the thing is, Jews are very interested in sex. They're very interested in sex. And he said, if I was in Auschwitz, I'd been in Auschwitz, I'd still have been checking out the women behind the barbed wire on the other side. And then he does a whole bit about saying, hey, yeah, you, yeah, when this is over, you know, do you want to have some luxuries? Do you want to go out? What do you want to do? And then he goes, what? What, is it me? Or is it like the whole thing? Right? Yeah. And I love that bit. And do you know why I love that bit? Hey, it's funny. But really importantly, the mini Metro joke, what does it do? It does the Nazis work. It dehumanizes Jews again. Sure. What does Larry David's routine do? It humanizes 
those people. Yeah. It says they're behind barbed wire and they're destined for the gas chambers and they're being made into vermin, but they were interested in sex and dinner and they were funny. And that's what's beautiful about it. And both of them are Holocaust jokes. So my point is about your mate is he's doing a boring joke. He's also doing a joke that leads to the destruction of Jews very far down the line. Yeah. Well, I don't speak to him anymore. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> not in like a not in like a we had a big because that's not the way I would ever do it. It was just like I just stopped sort of responding as much gradually over a period of years. It's interesting that you say he's. I'm interested in the fact that he's like almost exact type. That I'm sort of talking to might be in, him. In, in juice, don't count. <laughs> is yeah. Well, uh, uh, you know, when I wrote that book, when the film went out, I got like lots of Jews talking to me about it, and generally Jews in general are pretty lovely about it and sort of grateful that someone's articulating all this. But in a way, they're not the audience. I mean, they are the audience. So in terms of feeling less alone and feeling, but. I guess the audience or the people that I'm supposed to be speaking to are progressives. Mm -mm. And some progressives react very badly to the idea that they might have unconscious bias against Jews. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, I believe, when this was put to him, no, a particular thing was put to him on news agents, uh, which is, we talk, I had been on it before and I was talking about the mural. And I used the phrase, because they asked me if he was an anti-Semite, I said not at the front of his head. Uh, and that was put to him and he seemed to get annoyed about it and said how does, Jer how does David Baddiel know what's at the front and the back of my head is he my psychiatrist and Frank when I told him that said does he think all psychiatrists are Jews <laughs> yeah which, I was which, thinking that which, just yeah, now. <laughs> which I, I think was funny but I realised something then which is I should have used the words I shouldn't have said front of his head I should have used the word unconscious bias yes I should language have, I should have spoken their language because their language would say I think it's possible that he has unconscious bias towards Jews because to say well I don't is to say oh, okay so there's something different about this minority, because I thought all members who are not of a minority might show unconscious bias to them, but somehow mm -hmm. not against Jews, right? So anyway, so most progressives or some progressives find it difficult to accept that they might. But one guy wrote to me on social media and said that he'd read the book and he'd realized on reading it that he did harbor lots of assumptions about Jews, including the one that your mate hot is no longer your mate, which is that they're basically all rich and comfortable and privileged and mm -hmm. fine, and that he would now try and rethink it and realised he said he realised that anti-Semitism is the racism that sneaks past you, and that's true. I think that's what a lot of people find difficult and complicated about understanding what anti-Semitism is because it's not as obvious. You catch perhaps. it on the edge of a remark. Yeah, you catch it on the edge of a remark. You catch it on, in really unconscious bias. I'm quoting, I think, Hitchens. Uh, right. I'm not smart enough to come up with those You are sentences. pretty smart, actually. Uh, you are smart. Well, You're quite you. self-deprecating. Well, one, one, must, one has to be. Yeah, no? I, I'm not. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me, okay, I do we wanna, need to stop. We do, I, I we told my son that I'd be home for lunch. Yeah, just late lunch, late lunch. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, let's go. I was going to ask you why you came on it because many, uh, your legacy, legacy doesn't sound nice, a mainstream persona. Legacy. They call it legacy media now. Legacy media. Yeah, leg but legacy, I thought, as I said, it sounds like old, doesn't it? Legacy. Yeah, but no, but I sort of am part of legacy. You're legacy media. media. Yeah. There's been a few, Jimmy Carr's done a few podcasts, like people's podcasts, uh, Matthew McConaughey did as well, but a lot don't. Even when we get bigger views than a lot of the channels, why do you do it? You've been, you've been in trigonometry as well. Why, what's, what's it for you? Why did you? Because I like you. Thank um, you. And I hadn't met you properly and I thought it'd be interesting to talk to you. Um, I um, have some things to promote. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, tell me. <laughs> uh, also, you get a chance to talk yeah. on them. If, if truth is in the detail and the truth is always complex, then that is something that is quite difficult to get across on Lorraine, much as I like Lorraine. Uh, yeah. But when I've done Lorraine, it tends to be six minutes long. And sometimes she will ask me some quite complicated questions, but mm. you get longer to express the complexities on, on these kind of things. Um, also, yeah, you know, I don't know if I am straightforwardly legacy media. I think I'm, you know, I, I I did I was an early adopter of social media, and certainly before, like I'm much less on it now. But I think there was a period when it was one of my main avenues of self-expression. 
Right. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. one of my shows, and that's what I'm. By the way, I'm about to plug. Yeah. Well, well do one, as well. One of the do shows mix it subtly into this. Well, okay. Well, weave you've it ruined in. it now by saying do it. Do it. Do <laughs> it. Weave re- it in subtly. You've made it self conscious, <laughs> uh, as indeed is. I was going to say. I think when I arrived, I said like, if you want to ask me what the main problem is now, it's that we are all self conscious. That's what social media does. Mm. Social media creates a paralyzing self consciousness in all forms of speech. So even me, who is fairly unrestricted in the way I speak, like I am thinking about, oh, how's that going to play on social media? You're very self conscious. No, I'm not that self conscious. I say what I think. But but you later go, what did I say? Oh, I did. I didn't mean that. What I said. No, that's because I'm interested in the truth. Yeah. Uh, So you're you're self analytical. Yeah, but I am infected as well. We are all infected. We who have any kind of public platform with, oh, what's this going to? How's this going to play? How much hate am I going to get? How much Mm. roaring am I going to get? I stop caring. I stop caring. But well, I don't care as much as I used to at all. But even bringing that up can lead to roaring. I've noticed John Ronson today in the guardian essentially does something which i found myself wanting to say which is i'm sort of retiring from the world now and he says something about just listening to um uh in our time the melvin bragg podcast and wanting to tune out the world but that can lead to people shouting at you uh because it's sort of like oh you know you're too you think you're too high and mighty (laughs) yeah yeah. silence is violent violent. yes silence whatever whatever um Again, I've forgotten what this point was leading to. I think it was leading to you telling us where people can find your work. Oh, yes. Well, so one of the what it was leading to was the way I was going to very, very subtly weave it in <laughs> was to say that, uh, you know, a few years ago, um, yeah. I was more active on social media and I used to treat trolls as hecklers. And I eventually wrote a whole show, which I had to do over the two legs of the pandemic called Trolls, Not the Dolls. Uh, and actually, I don't. That show, when it when I do it again, which I am going to do, which mm. is what I'm getting to, fantastic, uh, it is um, going to be out of date. You know, I'm going to present three shows. I'm doing three shows, and they're very legacy because what's happened is Sky Arts have asked me to record uh, the three shows I've done over the last ten years, the stand-up shows, the one-man shows, and they are called Fame, not the musical, uh, My Family, not the sitcom, and Trolls, not the dolls. And they are very much about. They're sort of more one-man shows than they are straightforward stand-up shows. They involve using footage and all sorts of things, but they are, I think, funny. Um, but they are also emotional and thoughtful and whatever. Uh, and one of them is about fame, and one, and particularly about how it's difficult to stay authentic that people have a version of you out there that is not Mm. you. That's what that's about. My family is about my fucking mental childhood and my mental parents. Uh, And it's a sort of absolute... It's about authenticity as well, because it comes from noticing that when my mum died, all these people telling me that she was a wonderful woman and just thinking, you you didn't know her. Mm. You didn't know her. And that erases her. If you just say about dead people that they were wonderful, then you do not in any way remember them because people are revealed in their madnesses and their flaws and their idiosyncrasies. The dead, despite what we might like to think, are not angels, no. right? And Trolls is about social media and about my my treating of them as hecklers. Uh, but I am presenting them more or less as I did them at the time. I mean, there, there's a couple of... I'm, like, I'm not going to pretend my dad is still alive <laughs> in my family, for example. But I'm not, like, updating them massively yeah. because I want to do them sort of, like, more or less, like they were done. And I'm, I'm now presently redoing them i was doing them up and down the country but i'm going to do them record them at the royal court in mm. march mm. Uh, and that i'm plugging that because yeah, yeah, yeah. tickets are available to come we'll and see link. yeah come and see them being recorded at the royal court we'll put a link and where people can buy the tickets right yeah, that'll be great that'll yeah. be really good i yeah. went to trolls it was brilliant people do go because i, I had such a, i took my fiance we had a wonderful amazing time i got to text things in at the break it was good it was great amazing fun so please do go support david david who's a heretic you admire Who's a heretic I admire? Um, the person I think is cleverest in the world. No, not me. It's got to be someone. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. I'll choose someone else. Um, <laughs> is a psychoanalyst called Adam Phillips. Okay. Uh, who is a psychoanalytic writer. And if you want to know someone who treats every utterance as if like, well, what does this actually mean? And doesn't, um, it doesn't apply anything at all in terms of uh, received opinion. You should read Adam Phillips' books. Interesting. I, I think he'll be not someone who necessarily everyone uh, knows on here. Uh, mm. I guess the other person is Norm MacDonald, uh. who did sometimes get into some trouble on social media, I think. But uh, even though I'm, I've sort of moved away from stand-up, although the shows that I'm doing are stand-up, I don't know if I have completely moved away from stand-up, because even when I write Jews Don't Count or The God Desire, or indeed a new book I might be thinking about writing, which is about maleness, uh, they're quite complicated sort of almost philosophy books at some level, but I'm speaking in them 
like a stand-up. I don't mean that they're always funny, but in a vernacular, accessible, mm. talking to an audience kind of way. You have a way of being funny in serious topics, though. I've read, you know, quite yeah. a few of your books, and yeah. But yeah. despite that, so, so that's that was a sidebar about moving away from stand-up. Mm. But at some level, part of me is still enamoured by people who are unbelievably brilliantly funny stand-ups, and probably my favourite stand-up is Norm Macdonald, mm. uh, who don't if you know him. Yeah, he, he's passed away, didn't he? Yes, he died about two years ago. Mm. Uh, and he everything Norm did was funny. He was an unbelievably funny bone person. But also, and he was quite, I think, you would quite like some of his sure. less woke utterances. Yeah. The, the sense I have with Norm is that almost everything he said was just unfiltered, mm. what he thought, and a lot of the time what he thought was funny, but with an element of, I do actually think this. Um, and in a way, I think he died probably just at a point in time where that started to become completely unacceptable. Yeah. Or at least if it's not unacceptable, it becomes something else, which is perhaps what Ricky's doing and what Dave Chappelle is doing, which is a self-conscious idea of, I'm going to say stuff that is unacceptable. Norm wasn't doing that. Norm was just being funny. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I can enjoy, uh, you know, it's just left or right wing or what, you know, Stuart Lee, I can watch. Stuart Lee's brilliant. Hours. I love Stuart Lee. No, Stuart Lee's brilliant. Stuart Lee's. The, the only thing with Stuart Lee is sometimes he does this thing like he's doing like a, and he does it for like half an hour. Do you know what I mean? No, he's, I don't know that. He do, he's done a couple of acts where he's talking about someone's talking rubbish. He's doing an impression and he'll sort of go like, blah, 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 blah. No. And he does it for like half an hour. Yeah. And I, eventually I think I do, and it's sort of not funny for a while, and then it becomes funny again because he's yeah. been doing it so long. No, he does a thing where, where he does a, an impression and it will be funny forever. Or at least it will do it for so long that it won't be funny and then it'll be funny yeah. again. Uh, I do think he's brilliant. I mean, he's like a nightmare. Uh, he's a friend of mine, but a nightmare. Um, <laughs> uh, but he's, you know, he's the best stand-up in Britain. Do you think? Yeah. yeah. I th you've got, you have to listen to people with different, different sides. Uh, James Acaster's also, he's very woke. And yeah. I, 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 I laugh more he's really at him. Funny. He's, he's really, really funny gets me going so yeah. I think you have to and then Gervais is uh, very, very funny as well no, obviously Dave Chappelle I never found no he is funny I you think, think he funny? can be really funny yeah he yeah. can be are you in with the crowd you have like all the friends you, you, not you, with Dave Chappelle <laughs> no uh, I American. don't know him uh, I, well, I know most of these people yeah. I, I, you know yeah. yeah friends with some of them that's cool that's yeah. cool. Um, yeah, people, go to David's stuff <laughs> in the links and everything. Go and it's going to be an amazing show as well. So we'll put that. I'll put the Twitter and everything. Oh, and I'm actually things. doing. Yes. On when I record all three shows, which is quite yeah. unusual, kind of a weird thing. Yeah, I've done right. the goodbye now. You Sorry, no, I, but I just want to say, <laughs> so it's three nights yes. at the Royal Court. I'm doing a different show every night, twice a night. I see. Okay, yeah. Right. So yeah. it's going to be quite a marathon at yeah. my age to do that. Yeah. Are you going to be okay? I don't know. Do you want me to fill in I for some of the shows? I might be dead. And I watched a show yesterday. Uh, not a show, a documentary about Ronnie O'Sullivan. Yes. In which Damien Hurst said that Houdini said uh, <laughs> that if you want to sell tickets for something, say a death might occur. This is at the edge of existence <laughs> and the person doing it might at some point die. Yes. Right, And that's obviously how Houdini sold tickets. But his point was Ronnie O'Sullivan has an element of that. That when Ronnie O'Sullivan plays snooker, there's something so edgy and dark about the way that he plays, and he's depressive, whatever. That there's a sense in which a death might occur. Mm -hmm. That was his point. I don't know if it's absolutely true, but it, maybe it is about Ronnie O'Sullivan. Anyway, it's true enough about my six shows, uh, no, nine shows, no, six shows at the Royal Court because I am old enough to possibly you know? die. Fifty-nine. <laughs> I am old enough to possibly die yeah. just by doing that much work. Yeah, yeah. Or people, if you want to see, I mean, was it was it Tommy Cooper? Who who died? Yeah, Tommy Cooper died on stage. Tommy Cooper died. It happens. It might happen. <laughs> yeah, it might happen. <laughs> go so and get go. tickets. Go definitely come and see me. Support, just about live. Support David's family. Um, <laughs> yeah. Get tickets to go and see yeah. it. Keep watching this show as well. There's an episode here that will be a good episode that you should watch. Hit the like button and all those things. And uh, yeah, just keep on watching.